the dangers of dairy. Okay, can we go, Mark? We're on. Right. <coughs> right, dairy products have for decades been promoted as a whole or a complete food. We've always been told this is a perfect food, that if you're skipping a meal, I think we would have thought that. We went on these diets, and as long as you had your shake and a glass of milk, you've got a complete meal. And we were told to drink two glasses of milk a day to prevent osteoporosis and produce growth and development in healthy children. Now, if any of you have seen any of my children, I know Ananda has, and in fact, I meant to include a photograph, and it's the one thing that I left out. My grandson interrupted me today, so I left the photograph off, and I'll have to do it for the next time I do a talk like this. I had a photograph of myself and my three daughters. They're all taller than me, and they've all been raised without milk in their diet. The first two had some milk in their diet, the youngest one has had no milk in her diet whatsoever. She's breastfed, and from that she just went straight on to absolutely no milk. Yes, she's had a bit of cheese in her diet as the years have gone by, but no milk and yogurt and stuff like that. And um, Meredith, having never had a glass of milk in her life, she was given some to taste a couple of years ago, and she said, Mom, it was disgusting. It tasted like pus, because she's never developed a taste for it, a palate for it, she couldn't drink it. She's my tallest daughter. They're all quite a lot taller than I am. And Melissa, the oldest, is um, the shortest of the three, but she's still quite a lot taller than I am. And Meredith is the tallest. And, and right throughout school, she was drummed into it at, at primary school that you have to drink milk to grow. If you don't have milk, you won't grow. Weren't we all taught this? If you, won't have milk, if you don't have milk, you won't grow. Well, Meredith would promptly put her hand up and say, Ma'am, excuse me, Miss? And in the beginning, they didn't know what she was going to say. I haven't ever drunk milk in my life, and I'm the tallest kid in the class. Please, can you explain that to me? <laughs> so, you know, so we must have done something right. And one of the things was to not give them dairy, because I noticed that every time I gave my children dairy, they got sick. And every time a child is sick, their growth stops. It slows down. Because the body has to focus its energy on repairing the body, not on growing. So a child that has lots of tonsillitis and runny noses and ear infections, and a lot of, I mean, I grew up with, my brother was like that. I had lots of tonsillitis as a kid and had my tonsils out when I was four. So, um, with my children, and you can see what some of the research is. This is my personal opinion I'm giving you now. What's happened with us and our family. And what made me change was that my children stopped with the ear infections, the tonsillitis and the runny noses. They all three responded differently. Melissa got tonsillitis as a child. Marie Claire got a streaming nose. It would so, be so bad that it would actually form cuts in her nostrils here that would bleed. <clears throat> it was so acidic, just pouring out of her body. And then Meredith, the youngest, had ear infections. But it was all dairy, and yet all different responses. And if you look at some of the research from the Red Cross Children's Hospital, because I'm really going to be throwing some facts and figures and statements by people that are experts in their fields. Lots of these are, are very, this is, what I'm giving you now is not, you know, on the, in the presentation is not my personal opinion, it's information I've sourced from the export, experts. <clears throat> information that I can give you is that since I have re drastically reduced dairy from my diet and it most instances removed it, I mean I can go as I say for months without having any it, in my diet, and it does tend to be addictive, and you'll see that some of the research that one of the doctors has done, Dr. Neil Barnard, he's actually found that um, casein in dairy products is actually addictive, and it gives you a kind of an opiate, opioid effect. It, it, it makes you feel like kind of really happy and slightly high, actually. It's one of the reasons, and it's higher in cheese than it is in yogurt and milk. It's one of the reasons why we just love cheese so much. And You know, you crave cheese, but you can kind of miss out on the cheese, the yogurt and the milk, you know. But it, part of the reason is that addictive substance that's in it, okay? So, <clears throat> this is what we've been told. We've got to drink milk and eat cheese and yogurt to prevent osteoporosis. The food once thought of as essential is now being found to be the main, main cause of type 1 diabetes. That's the insulin dependent, injecting yourself three times a day kind of diabetes. We're not talking about controlling it with diet. Type 1, the type you see in children. It was Johns Hopkins University in 1991 that was one of the first universities to release the research that showed that one of the protein fractions in cow's milk called P63 was the actual protein that upset the pancreas to such an extent in certain people that it actually stopped it producing insulin. And these people developed, and when you, fascinating stuff was, I was working with Andre Kruger many years ago, we took people off, uh, this one diabetic that he took of was type 1, a youngster. He was uh, 19 years old, had been diagnosed at the age of 13. Um, and he took him all the dairy products out of his diet and his blood sugar stabilized. 
totally stabilized. But he, like everybody else, had been told he had to have dairy every day. And in fact, we we're actually told the new sort of food pyramids and the, the way we've been taught is that we need to be eating dairy at just about every single meal, you know, a bit of yogurt or milk for breakfast. And then for lunch, you're going to have a yogurt dressing and for supper, you're going to have cheese with your meal, you know. Two to three servings a day, that's what you're told. If you look at the food pyramid, that's what it's going to tell you to have, okay? Right, now Dr. Colin, T. Colin Campbell, he is the Jacob Gould Schumann Professor Emeritus of Nutritional Biochemistry of Cornell University, okay? Oh, I got that out, okay? Now, he has written the most amazing book, and if you don't have it yet, please go home and order it off the internet. It's not available, the China Study. The cheapest place to get it is from the publishers. They're called Ben Bella Books. Ben as in the man's name, Bella as in the girl's name. I think it was his son's and, son and his daughter's name, the publisher who started the company. Ben Bella Books, I think it you pay nine, $19.95. It's like 120 Rand for a hardcover book like this. You can't even buy a hardcover book like this in South Africa. Gets to you in about six weeks. If you're really interested in nutrition and you want to know what the latest information says, get this book. It looks very formal, although Dr. Colin Campbell got all the information and the research, his son has written it, who is a journalist and a layperson, not a scientist, so it's written in a readable format. Your mind will be blown away. You will never be the same person. You will not, after reading this book, okay? Get it, order it, go to Ben Miller Books, tell them I sent you, but order this book, okay? <coughs> It's considered, it says, the most comprehensive study of nutrition ever conducted. The book was released last year. The research was completed in 91. It's taken that long to extrapolate all this information. And they're still getting information out of it. The f information that Dr. Colin Campbell found has changed his life and his family's life. And he never went into it wanting to change his life. He's just a scientist. You look at his research and how many published papers he's published. It was with uh, Sir Richard Peter, who was knighted for his research into cancer. It was supposed to be research into cancer, but they found so much other stuff, okay? Um, <clears throat> he goes into a lot of the politics in the food industry as well, right at the end. But it's um, mind-blowing stuff. You've got to read that one, okay? Uh, what he says, besides contributing to heart disease, and he's got all the research, the wonderful thing about that book is you read it as if it's kind of a novel, in a sense, you're reading it, but it's got references for everything he says, and you can check the references out. They actually do exist. Very often when I, people put references in books and I go and check them out, I can't find them. These ones you can find, okay? Besides contributing to heart disease, cancer of almost all types, dairy products are a major factor in autoimmune diseases. So heart disease, he's saying, cancer, and he has all the research to back it up, and autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases, top of the list is diabetes, and then things like multiple sclerosis, which he goes into a lot of detail as to, he believes from the research, there's a, not he believes, he, sh he shows you the research, it shows it's one of the main causes of multiple sclerosis, if not the cause. Cow's milk protein, this is what he says, <coughs> supplies many foreign proteins that mimic our own, setting us up for one of many autoimmune diseases. The protein in cow's milk is very similar to some of the proteins in our body. So when it keeps coming in from the source, the body starts to say that this is a dangerous thing happening and starts to produce antibodies against these pro proteins. And it appears to be attacking, in those autoimmune diseases, it appears that the body is attacking itself. And yet, when they found they take the dairy products out of the diet, we're talking strict dairy, not eating it even occasionally like I do, that these problems occur again. Now, they start off with, the top of the list is type 1 diabetes, and in, it's the type of diabetes that is diagnosed in adults, but very, it's the type of diabetes you will find in children, from small babies to 13-year-olds. Graves' disease, <coughs> rheumatoid arthritis. Now, I remember reading research in the Lancet Journal, October 1991, for those of you who have done the course will remember this question because it's a trick question. In the test, if you haven't done the test, I say which, what statement, something like what statement was made <coughs> concerning um, rheumatoid arthritis in the August 1991 journal, and it's the wrong date, and you're supposed to correct it, and like 10% of the students get it, so I'm giving you the secret now, okay? You lose a point if you don't correct the date. <laughs> All right. Rheumatoid arthritis, what it, what it says is that a gluten-free vegetarian diet has been shown to um, ease or get rid of rheumatoid arthritis in a lot of people. And in that research, I remember reading the original research in the Lancet Journal, it actually still included dairy products in the diet. So they found that even with a little bit of dairy in the diet, now they're saying that no, 
the dairy is actually a contributing factor to rheumatoid arthritis. It's an interesting exercise to do, take it out. I always say to people is if you don't think it's causing your problem, take it out for six weeks and see what happens. If you're craving cheese all the time, it indicates a lack of essential fatty acids and that means you should be taking flax oil and other oil blends on a regular basis. You take the Amiga by AIM, you can take it in capsule form, it's got your sesame, your sunflower, your olive and your flax, <clears throat> all in balance, the Omega 3s and 6s. If you're taking enough Omega 3s and 6s on a daily basis in the right form, you stop craving cheese. The reason we crave it is when you're wanting the fat, that's part of it. Of course, Dr. Um, Neil Barnard says it's also because it has this opioid effect. Right, <clears throat> thyroiditis, which is basically inflammation um, of the thyroid gland, thyroid problems. Vitiligo, which is a skin condition where you lose the pigmentation in your skin. Michael Jackson claims to have been suffering from it, and that's made him white. <laughs> Pernicious anemia. Now, let's see if you can say this one. <laughs> Glomerulonephritis. It's a kidney disease, okay? Multiple sclerosis. <coughs> Lupus, which is an autoimmune disease. It starts with... There's two types of lupus, we're not going to go into detail, but it causes a lot of redness on the skin and flaking, and you get a lot of aches and pains in the joints. It's almost like a form of arthritis that you get as well. And then they treat you with cortisone. They say there's no cure, they put you on cortisone, and then you blow up to twice, three times your side. I'll never forget a woman that I dealt with many years ago, and we got her diet right. She had terrible lupus. She was huge. She was grossly overweight. She was a beast. And she lost all this weight, and she kept telling me how she used to be a model, and I thought, you're right. You know, people always tell you how they used to be a model, and now they're like, we're size, um, <coughs> you know, weigh 160 kilograms or something. But, and honestly, in the space of six months, she went down to the size she was, and I remember her standing up and actually showing a group of people this dress that she used to wear, just by sorting her diet out. <coughs> and that's considered incurable. Medical professionals say lupus is incurable, you can control it, but you can't cure it. But if you change your diet, you go into complete remission, okay? Sjogren's disease, which is another... These are all basically um, autoimmune diseases where the body ap appears to be attacking itself. Myasthenia gra gravis, Addison's disease, scleroderma, uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, a liver condition, uvit uvitis, which is an eye condition, and chronic active hepatitis. Okay. It's quite a lot of different diseases. You may think, well, we've never heard of those things. But I'm sure you've heard of lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. When we were growing up as kids in South Africa, very few of us had ever heard these. Even as my mom had never heard of these diseases. And she was quite health conscious for her time. I mean, we weren't allowed to eat white bread or chew gum or drink fizzy cold drinks. And, and, and she had medical textbooks. She had a medical book in the house. And I remember staring at these awfully gory pictures of these horrible, terrible skin diseases. And did you ever look at these medical books that your mother or father had? I'd look at it and think, I, I could not stop looking at the books, but I'd feel sick in my stomach looking at them. I, we'd never ever come across. Now it's very common, multiple sclerosis, a lot of people have lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, goodness sake, the youngest child I've seen with rheumatoid arthritis was a 13-month-old baby with rheumatoid arthritis in the fingers. And now the worst case of arthritis I've ever seen was in a nine-year-old boy. His joints had completely fused and he couldn't even bend his knees. His hands were like claws and he'd have to walk like this. And we changed his diet and the physiotherapist had never seen such mobility in his joints. He was improving dramatically, but the mother decided it was too much effort. She should rather just let him eat whatever he felt like it. I didn't understand it at the time. I still don't, okay? This is what Dr. Colin Campbell says. Imagine looking at the front page of the newspaper and finding the following headline. Cow's milk, the likely causes of lethal type 1 diabetes. Because the reaction would be strong and the economic impact monumental. This headline won't be written anytime soon regardless of the scientific evidence. It's there. The evidence is there. You can check out his references. They're all in recognized medical and nutritional journals. And when you read them, you think, why is nobody doing anything about this? Every now and again, you'll see a tiny little column somewhere. I remember the first time I picked up on the whole thing with dairy um, causing juvenile diabetes was about 1991, when that research from Johns Hopkins came out. There was a tiny little article like this, like at the bottom of the fourth page. There was no internet at the time, so I couldn't go onto the internet and look at it. Well, none of it was accessible to anybody in the street. <coughs> and um, I phoned and... 
searched and got journals and got hold of a copy of the, of, of, of the different things and, and wrote to people and got the information. But it was this tiny, tiny amount. And from there, the evidence has just grown and grown and grown. Never see it in the newspaper. Dietetics, as it's taught in the universities in South Africa, is funded by the dairy industry. You can go and check the large dairy industry co companies that produce dairy products. Fund the universities that teach dietetics. And when a dietitian qualifies, they are taught that children need to have cow's milk at every single meal, in some form or another. Charlotte Meshadu, who wrote the book Healthy Kids with me, she said, Mary and I had four children and everything I'd learned as a dietitian at university didn't work. Dairy made my kids sick. And yet I was drummed into me that I had to have it. It was only years later that she discovered that a lot of the funding at the university she was at came from the dairy industry. <coughs> so it's, it has economic, huge, huge economic implications if we were to see this on the front page of the Argus. And then ongoing stories on carte blanche and, you know, just ongoing, on, it was just everything we've ever been taught, the whole foundation. It was like discovering that the world is round when we thought it was flat. <coughs> Except that nobody made money out of saying that the world was flat. Whereas the, there's just so many industries that are built up in this. Huge, huge industries. So it's a very difficult... I understand the implications of publishing this stuff and actually going out mainstream with it. But there are a lot of people... And I think, personally think, in years to come we're going to see lawsuits like we're seeing with the cigarette, cigarette industry. Because if we know, and the evidence is there and it's overwhelming, and we're talking 20 references just in one book for the same thing, juvenile diabetes. If it's known, and the medical profession know it, and it's in the research and it's documented, it's going to be just like the cigarette industry. We're a substance that was harmful to us. We knew it in the 1960s, we knew it in the 1970s, it was only in the 1980s, it was 20, 30 years later that people started suing and saying that you had to have warnings on cigarette packets. And yet, when my mom was pregnant with her children, she was told by the doctors, it's fine to smoke and be pregnant. Because that was what they were told, that there were no side effects of smoking. I don't want to sound like I'm trying to frighten you tonight, but you may be suffering from terrible health problems and not know that it is from dairy. <coughs> and don't go to your diabetic friend and tell them they're diabetic because they drink milk, okay? They don't want to hear that stuff. Just keep the information to yourself and make yourself healthy, so healthy that everybody turns around and says, what are you doing? You look amazing. I mean, Ananda, you must get that all the time. This woman was, could hardly get out of bed. In fact, you couldn't get out of bed. It's true. Changed her diet. Right, Dr. Neil Barnard, who wrote the book Breaking the Food Seduction, I brought them with me so you could see that we are not making this up. Unfortunately, most of these books are not available in South Africa. Um, how do I find them? Years of reading the articles. The Food Seduction, you can get this off um, this website here. <coughs> www.anhs.org Okay. You can get the, in fact, all of the books that I'm talking about tonight, not all of them, Fats That Heal, Fats That Kill, you can't get off, but the China study you can get from them as well. It's just going to cost you $5 more. So if you want to get them from one site, you can go to that website. Breaking the Food Seduction, Dr. Neil Barnard, you can go onto his website, which is drneilbarnard.com. What I like about this guy and Dr. Colin Campbell, they're not selling anything. They're not selling you a replacement. They're not offering you anything in place of it. There's no commercial interest whatsoever. In fact, Dr. Colin Campbell doesn't even have his own website. I've looked. You type in Dr. Colin Campbell, you only get the publisher. No website. Not in it for any money. He just put his findings in it. And from 1991 until the beginning of last year, he had changed his entire family. I mean, the guy's in his 70s here. He's not, a, he's, not a, he's not a Mickey Mouse. He's not a young academic who's like young academic, you know, arrogant upstart. He's been around a long time. In fact, Gary Player has read the China study and now he's on the program and he's telling everybody to read the book and he was performed his best at the recently. Who follows the golf? My husband was telling me. He was like right up there with all the youngsters just recently. <coughs> right, so breaking the food seduction, Dr. Neil Barnard. He heads a... Um, President and founder of the Physicians Commit Committee for Responsible Medicine. Interesting man. 
He's the guy that was involved in exposing the fact that Atkins died of a heart attack, not of, from falling on the pavement. He's, he's the guy that got hold of the autopsy report. <coughs> right, he says cheese is addictive as it contains casein like other dairy products. Casein is broken down into the digestive tract to form opiates called casomorphins. Did you know that? You learned a new word tonight, eh? I'm craving some casomorphins. <laughs> Cheese appears to be more addictive than any other dairy products due to its much higher levels of casein. That's one of them, but I have found, I've personally found when you have enough essential fatty acids in your diet, you don't have that craving. Ask me, I was the original cheese addict. I could eat a kilogram of cheese a day and not flinch. Just be full of mucus. Really, I mean, serious post-nasal debut. Took my tonsils out when I was four. The problem didn't go away, it just went somebody else. So I ended up with sinusitis and, and ear infections, blocked ears and... Even now, if I eat dairy like three, four days in a row, my ears start getting sore, my sinuses, I start getting sinus headaches. And when I don't have dairy in the diet, no sinus, no post-nasal drips, none of the problems that I used to have. It also affects, I found with myself and a lot of other women, it affects your menstrual period. You find you have a much heavier menstrual period when you have dairy in the diet on a regular basis as well. Right, he says, including dairy in breastfeeding, mother's diet is a cause of colic. A lot of mothers have figured this out for themselves. A lot of moms have just found when they have dairy in their diet, the baby gets colic, okay? And you can think, well, how does this happen? Does the milk go? It's not the milk, just the milk. And we, a lot of moms have said to me, but I want low-fat milk. It's not the fat in the cow's milk that causes the problem. It's one of the 25 protein fractions that's in there that gets into the breast milk of the mother and that gets fed to the baby. And their digestive tract doesn't know what to do with it. And they get terrible cramps and pain. It's a sign from the baby to say, stop doing what you're doing. When a baby gets colic, the baby's saying, don't feed me whatever you're feeding me. And if you're breastfeeding, it's saying, well, look at your diet, which is, makes it difficult. Because you've got to follow a very careful diet when you're breastfeeding, if your baby responds like this, okay? <clears throat> Cheese also contains an amphetamine-like substance called phenylethylalamine, PEA. So there's two drug-type substances in cheese, unfortunately. <laughs> They're also in chocolates. It doesn't mean you're never going to have it. There's lots of information here, but it's really the hormones and chemicals that have been identified in cow's milk from prolactin, which is a hormone that produces breast milk in, in humans. It's also in cows, but if men are having them, we've started seeing breast formation in men. It's becoming very common in young men that are not even overweight. And part of the reason is they're being exposed to a lot of prolactin. The cows are being fed a lot of hormones to increase milk production, so the levels are much higher than they would normally be if the cow was just feeding its young. And if we were to have it occasionally and not three times a day like it's been drummed into us, if we had it like in China, the only community that consume milk of any kind are in the northern regions of China, and they're the, they're the, um, it's only in winter when there's a shortage of food. And then they have goat's milk. But it's because there's a shortage of food, and it's just for literally... A couple of months. All right, so you, uh, somastatin, melatonin, oxytocin, also to do with breastfeeding, growth hormone, luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone, thyrotropin releasing hormone. This all has to do with actually milk production in, hu in women, okay? A lot of women who've never had children secrete <coughs> a fluid from their nipples. Women that have had children 30 years ago secreting. Still, still some kind of milky substance. Take the dairy out of the diet, that stops. We, I've had women over the years have been told they've got a um, tumour on the, on the um, pituitary gland because they keep secreting milk. And when you take dairy out of the diet, the tumour disappears. Okay, so we can go on. I mean, we've got corticosteroids, insulin. It just goes on forever and ever, okay? Any and all of these can interfere with the chemical processes in your body, and very often they do. That's why it can cause so many varying different problems in the body, okay? Dairy is also a major contributor to headaches. I found when you take dairy out of the diet, the headaches very often go. It's not the only cause, but it can be. It's the most common trigger in rheumatoid arthritis. This is according to Dr. Neil Barnard. Neil Barnard, you can open his book, and I think it's page 24, and you can read, no, page 56, you can read it all here. If it's my book, it's been underlined and written and scribbled, I write in all my books, and I don't lend people books, so don't ask me. I used to, they never used to come back, you've all done that, you lend somebody a book, it never comes back, I say, no, if you want to read my book, you come sit in my house and you read it. 
you really want to read it, come here and read it if you can't afford it. I don't mind. Just don't take it home. Take it and take it out of my house. I had some books that are completely out of print. Um, one that I lent to a young doctor and man, I regret that book anyway. It's here. It's all in here, okay? Harvard studies have shown that men who avoid dairy products have a 30% reduction in prostate cancer. Dairy appears to increase the IGFI, which is the insulin growth factor 1, which also has been linked to breast cancer. So there appears to be a strong link between prostate and breast cancer and dairy products. Again, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to frighten you. I'm giving you the facts. This is what the research shows. You can take it or leave it, okay? Go home and have a pizza. By the way, they're on making pizzas next door if you want to have one. <laughs> dairy... <laughs> you can have a pizza without cheese, yeah? If you want a gluten-free one, go to Colcaccio's and get a gluten-free pizza with no cheese. Lots of Avo gives it that creamy... You get satisfaction from having ever on it. Dairy suppresses vitamin D activation, increasing the risk of all cancers and contributing to osteoporosis. Vitamin D is needed for the body to use calcium and has been found to be essential in preventing cancer. This is one of the reasons why the research, and I talk about it in my latest book, Take Control, this one here. If you don't have it, I talk about why um, the, some of the latest research, and just talking latest, the last 20 years shows that using sunblock actually contributes to skin cancer. And one of the reasons it does is it stops you producing vitamin D in the skin. Because when you get your skin exposed to sun on, in a moderate level, we're not talking about peak midday sun, you're able to produce enough vitamin D and that helps to protect your body against cancer. So people that actually do get exposed to sun uh, on a moderate level, have less chance of developing skin cancer, particularly if their lifestyle and diet is healthy. Of course, if you're just eating any old rubbish and sitting in the sun for hours on end, you're going to damage your skin. But one of the reasons is because then you make enough vitamin D, and when you've got enough vitamin D, it protects you against cancer. So what, what dairy actually does is it suppresses vitamin D activation. Vitamin D has to be activated, basically, in the body. And it suppresses that activation so that you can't use vitamin D. And that's part of the reason it appears to contribute to cancer. Dr. Walter Weit, spelled Weith, but he says Weit. <coughs> he uh, is of German descent. In fact, he's still got a slight accent. He's lived in South Africa, but travels a lot. He was past, he was chairman of the Department of Zoology at the University of the Western Cape, and he now travels. You can go onto his website, type his name into Google and get a search. You'll see he travels all over the world doing talks on nutrition and health. He really got into interesting that he was involved, he's involved in zoology and went into human nutrition and so was Dr. Colin Campbell. And they both, at opposite ends of the world, have found basically the same results in, in different ways. Right, he says in his book, and this is the book, some of you may have a copy of this. I don't know where to get hold of these anymore. If you look at Walter White, spelt that way, in Somerset West, he has a telephone number in the book, but nobody ever answers it. So maybe he was in Germany every time I phoned, because I've tried to get more copies. This book's called Diet and Health. If you can get a hold of it, it's published by CRC Press. But in here he says, consumption of cheese has doubled in Western diets since 1977. So have the above diseases. The very diseases that we've been speaking about have doubled the same time that our consumption of cheese. Dairy products was never really promoted that much when we were kids. We were told to drink it, but I mean, we didn't have television for starters. There were no magazines that I can remember. I think one or two magazines, but it wasn't something that was pushed down your throat. Now it's every time you open the magazine, switch on television. Man, if it's not yogurt they're promoting, it's milk. And if it's not that, I mean, the huge amounts of money are spill, spent promoting it. Calcium in dairy is more difficult to absorb than calcium in whole wheat bread. And whole wheat bread has not been considered a good source of calcium. Because there's phytic acid in wheat, it binds the calcium. So it's more difficult to absorb than the calcium in whole wheat bread. And as I say, whole wheat bread, whole wheat grain has always, in fact, flour, wheat-based products have always been considered a poor source of calcium because the phytic acid binds the calcium. So yes, there's a lot of calcium. We're going to look at exactly how much calcium is in cow's milk, but you're going to see what the problem is. I'll show you later on. An investigation into the effects of various protein diets and calcium retention showed that proteins from dairy cause considerable calcium loss in the urine. But it's not only the protein. We now know that there's so too much phosphorus in cow's milk, and we'll get there. In other words, drinking milk and eating cheese and yogurt results in you urinating calcium from your bones into the sewage system. And that ties up with the research that shows very clearly 
that the people that consume the most dairy products, and you can take a look at it, you can look at the statistics, we're not talking about the hype, the marketing, we're not talking about any of that. The people that consume dairy products on a regular daily basis, the ones that consume the most, those people living in the UK, in the United States, in South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, and in European countries, those are the people that have the most osteoporosis or brittle bone disease. People where they consume very little calcium. For example, in the 1960s, research was done here in South Africa that found people living in rural communities didn't consume very much dairy at all, like 75 or 100 milligrams a day. And we've been told that 1,500 milligrams. We've got to keep increasing it, keep increasing it. The average intake by the, the colored community, I think, was about 300 milligrams. And the average intake by the white population in those days, which was divided, it was interesting research to do, 750, I think it was, no, 500 to 600 milligrams a day. And where did they find the most osteoporosis and dental decay? amongst the white community in South Africa. Funny thing happened, because everybody said it's genetic. What happened is people from the rural communities became educated and came and lived in the cities, and now we're starting to see osteoporosis in the black community. It was unheard of before. In China, when Dr. Colin Campbell did the research, osteoporosis again, unheard of in China, but in China, you don't drink milk. The Chinese say if you drink the milk, it's the same as drinking the animal's blood. So they don't drink it, it's not part of their culture. And again, they were said this is genetic, the Chinese are just lucky. But when a Chinese family went and lived in America and followed an American diet, within one generation they developed osteoporosis because they, they adopted the American diet. So what happened to the genetic issue then? Gone. Okay. Right. Moreover, calcium supplementation does not provide a solution as countries such as the United States still have the highest rates of osteoporosis. And where's the highest rates of calcium supplementation? In the United States. In fact, there is research, 5,000 different studies done over a period of many years shows clearly that over 5,000 studies shows that taking Calcium supplements does not prevent osteoporosis or increase bone density in any possible way on a long term. It tends to settle on the outside of the bones, not increase the density. And the minute you stop taking it, you lose whatever's built up on the outside anyway. Oh, goodness. Immunoglobulins from cow's milk will interact with the immune system and this can lead to an allergic reaction. Many allergies can primarily be attributed to cow's milk. And that is... Professor Walter Weitz saying that. 100% of newly diagnosed patients with insulin-dependent diabetes have antibodies to bovine serum albumin. In plain English, okay, in case you don't know what any of that is, because it's all these strange words, 100% of new cases of type 1 diabetes have been found to have antibodies to cow's milk protein, implicating cow's milk protein as the cause of the disease. Now, it has been isolated that that one particular protein damages the pancreas. The funny thing is, type 1, you consider that's it, you'll never make insulin. But when we take dairy out of the diet, these people start to make insulin and respond amazingly well. Moreover, there have been reports of infants that are only breastfed and never received milk protein, developing allergies to cow's milk, which then alleviated when mothers eliminated dairy from their diet. So it's basically what I said earlier on. And, and mothers know this. Anybody who's breastfed their babies knows. The baby gets colic and runny noses and ear infections. And it took me a while to learn that. I remember when I was feeding Meredith, my youngest daughter. She was just being breastfed and she kept getting this blocked nose. She couldn't breathe. And there's nothing worse than a breastfed baby being not able to breathe because, man, that milk comes down at a frightening rate. Once the milk lets down, baby can hardly swallow. Now it's trying to suck but can't breathe at the same time. You try blocking your nose and shoving liquid down your mouth at a frightening rate and see what happens to you. <laughs> and I was giving her her first and only bit of medication she ever had, this bright red decongestant. I was about to put it into her mouth at like 11 o'clock at night. I'd driven into Hillbrow to find the only open pharmacy between me living in Johannesburg. And I, my, my baby's nose is so blocked she can't breathe. And, and they gave me this bright red decongestion. I was about to put it into her body and I just said to Mark, I can't do this. I cannot put this bright red stuff into her body. She's not suffering from a deficiency of decongestant. <laughs> She's not. Why has she got this blocked nose? And that's when I really started looking at this whole issue of diet in more detail. At that point, I was really into it, but now it was... And let me tell you, at that point in my life, I'd cut dairy down 
dramatically. I was having like a slice on, on a couple of pieces of Provita. You know, it was like typical woman diet food, low fat cottage cheese on Provita, you know, terrible stuff that we used to have. Like that was food. There was a tiny amount. I thought there's no way that that little bit of cottage cheese I'm having can affect her. Took it out. Meredith's nose cleared. And that was the end of it. I had dairy. I found she started getting ear infections any time I had dairy. So for 16 months that I was breastfeeding her, I literally had to avoid dairy as much as I possibly could. All right, Dr. Marilyn Glen Glenville. I don't think this is here either. I got this one in the UK last year. Osteoporosis, a silent epidemic. She's a leading nutritional therapist specializing in women's health in the UK and fellow of the Royal Society of Medicine. You can go online and she's got a website you can go on to and the publisher of this is called Kyle Cathy Publishing. What she says is milk has been linked to ovarian cancer and again she's got her references and you can check them out. Why am I giving you these references? Just in case. You go and tell somebody, oh, yeah, Mary Ann Shearer, what does she know? You know, anybody in South Africa knows nothing, but if somebody's from overseas, they know everything. You can tell them these were all overseas people, all specialists in their field, in fact, so highly qualified. There's nobody as highly qualified as Dr. Colin Campbell in the world. He's the most qualified nutritional biochemist. There's just nobody that can compete with the guy. All right, right. Udo Rasmus, okay, the guru on fats. So what does he say? He says dairy products are low in essential fatty acids. They raise the triglyceride and cholesterol levels. They increase the platelet stickiness, which means you form clots easier, contributing to heart disease. Okay, so there's another expert. An extra, as Nanda would say. Right, Dr. Matola here from the Red Cross Children's Hospital right here in Cape Town. In a pediatric uh, journal called PedMed in July 1990, says cow's milk contains more than 25 separate protein fractions, each capable of inducing an allergic response. Number one, the gastrointestinal response to one of these, some of these proteins is diarrhea, vomiting, failure to thrive, colic, gastrointestinal bleeding, often resulting in anemia, and protein losing enteropathy. And that's not just this, they're talking about babies here, but this happens in adults as well, okay? Respiratory, that's meant to be highlighted. Respiratory problems, rhinitis, which is the runny nose, asthma, serous otitis media, ear infections, and Hynes syndrome, which is similar to an autoimmune. Skin, eczema problems, urticaria, angioedemia, anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is when the allergy gets so bad that your lungs actually close and you can't breathe. Some kids are allergic to it. And neurological irritability and restlessness. You very often find a baby very irritable and restless because the mum's had dairy in the diet. Well, this, is just, this has been found out right here under our noses, but of course he's South African, so we won't listen to him, will he? Um, you do. Well, the irritability and restlessness is what happens is the central nervous system is being affected, and when that's affected, the child can have really <coughs> bad dreams. They can sleep badly. And these moms that are always saying... <coughs> My baby won't sleep through the night. Well, take them off the dairy. What do you feed a child that's not being breastfed? Give it goat's milk if you have to give it something. But you can re-stimulate the breast to produce your, your own milk, even if you've been off it for months. In fact, I've read articles on women who've adopted children, never had babies before adopted children, been able to stimulate their breasts to produce milk by letting the child suck. It's a sucking action that produces, and the more you allow them to suck, the more milk you produce. Right, what are you going to do, okay? Because the big question people are going to say is like, what are we going to do, okay? If you're having cereals in your diet, then whether they're for breakfast, lunch or supper, replace milk in natural cereals. When I say natural cereals, please, breakfast is not chocolate-coated cereals and strawberry-coated cereals. That is feeding a child sweets for breakfast. I don't care if it's got vitamins A, D, E and K. I cannot believe the rubbish that they put on television and on those packets, for goodness sake. You, they lead you to believe that it's the most nutritious food in the world. And they tell you it's the most nutritious cereal. Well, that doesn't mean a thing, because most cereals are not that nutritious. But if you feel you want to have a natural cereal, whether it's a muesli, and have one that's got no, you know, filled up, but they just bulk these things up with bran, which used to get thrown away as pig food, and then, you know, you think it's like really cheap, but it's mainly bran that's, and they're just going to, 
either clog up, some people it actually causes constipation and some people it causes diarrhea. But there are better ways to get roughage in your diet than just adding a whole bunch of bran, okay? If you feel you want something like muesli, or you really can't get away from your puffed rice or whatever it is, then have the one without the sugar. Sweeten it with honey, sweeten it with some fresh or some dried fruit. And what you can actually sweeten it with is natural juices. Take your liquid fruit grape or your apple, the less acid ones will digest better with it. The grape or the apple juice and pour that over the cereal. If you're looking for something creamy and frothy, take a banana, throw it in your blender, fill it up with some filtered water. And Brita's given us a jug tonight, so I'm going to tell you Brita filtered water. I use the Brita jugs at home, so I don't have any problems with that at all. Find that the best value for money and the only company that's ever given me actual research from the CSIR showing that it's removed all the baddies, all the bacteria. There'd been this water problems the last. I heard somebody on radio saying, there's no water filter system that can, I love it when they're so arrogant. No water filter system that can re remove the bacteria in water. Well, the breeder water filter does. I've seen the research from the, 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 the documentation of the CSIR. They showed before and after it removed all the bacteria. Because there's silver in the cartridge and that destroys it. That's part of the reason, okay? So banana milk. You take the banana, throw it in your blender, and it's up to you how thick you want it or how thin you want it. You add some breeder filtered water. You switch your blender on. If you want it cold, put some ice cubes in there. You can even freeze your overripe bananas. Take the frozen bananas out, throw them in, put some filtered water in, and you've got this frothy, creamy, beautiful banana milk. It's very nutritious. Bananas are considered the most nutritious fruit or vegetable. I mean, out of just about every food, Dr. Louis Mayer, the chemical pathologist, was asked by Dr. Conrad Smith at a discussion group I was at many years ago, what is the most perfect food to eat? Without a question, he said a ripe banana. He said it leaves the best chemical residue in the blood once you've digested it. Out of all the foods you can eat. And you think of little kids, how they love bananas. They just instinctively know those foods are good for them. All right. It must be ripe, otherwise they're a bit difficult to digest. Avoid tea or coffee if you can. If you really feel you've got to have it, you can have goat's milk or soy milk in small quantities. You can also have coconut milk. But just read the labels of the coconut milk or the coconut cream. Yes, it's got saturated fat, but the good quality ones, they're not heated or processed in any way. Well, they, sh they would actually heat them to sterilize it. That's the only heating that would go through. But it's still a better option. Being a saturated fat, it can't react chemically, so it's very stable. But read the labels, because some of them have got preservatives and they've got um, sulfites in them, which can close your chest. So the good makes, I think there's one out there called Mayfair. Uh, there's Shogun, I think it's called. What are the other brands that don't have preservatives in? But it gives you a slight coconutty taste. If, you f if you're looking for something to put in your tea or coffee that tastes more like milk, probably your soy milk, then go for your plain soy milk. We make a pl so plain soy milk powder with nothing added. There's no creamy flavorings. You know, when this is creamy soy, they've gone and added like coffee creamer, like cremora, to the soy to give it that sort of creamy taste. And that stuff is like, coffee creamers are highly carcinogenic, it's a highly processed fat. You just avoid those things. But you'd even be better off with a little bit of fresh cream diluted with water. And you're saying, but it's dairy. The cream doesn't have the protein in that causes all the problems. It's just fat. It's like using butter. There's very little protein in there. Some, every now and again, I find some people still react to the cream. There's still a little bit of that protein in there. And if you're very sensitive to the cow's milk protein, it'll cause problems. There is no physiological need for humans to have milk. There is no scientific, sound scientific research done on real people that proves, it, it, not even remotely, that human beings need milk in their diet. There's no research like that. We have been fed information that they've wanted us to believe it's just been very clever marketing. In fact, it was Chris Barnard, Dr. Chris Barnard's son, not son, his brother, Dr. Marius Barnard at a health convention many years ago in Sun City, and he said, the human species, are the, is, the human beings are the only species that refuse to be weaned. We refuse to be weaned. We've got this obsession with having milk in our diet. That's why we come up with things like rice milk. We're desperate to have milk. You can actually live without milk. We haven't had milk in our house for 20 years. <laughs> you come to my house, you want tea, you get tea with coconut milk in it, or tea with banana milk in it, or tea with soy milk in it, I'll put some soy milk powder, or just plain black tea. 
You won't even get real tea in my house. You get robots or herb tea or my favourites if I'm going to have a, a hot drink is actually to take liquid fruit and top it up with boiling water. Other than that, I have a, a malted carob, which is when I want Horlicks, kind of a Milo taste to it. Right. <coughs> Where are you going to get your calcium from, okay? Now, I brought this other table with me as well. It's not an easy thing to get hold of. You can't just sort of go out and buy this in the shop. We buy them in batches, and we've got to especially order them, and we've got to go to the security gate and pay in advance, and all kinds of strange things. If you're doing or have done the natural health and nutrition consulting course, if you've done that course, you get one of these with it. From the Medical Research Council, it's the MRC food composition tables, and you can look up in here the calcium levels of countless different things. And let's take, what fruit would you like me to look up? I'll start with oranges, if there's any other fruit you want me to look up. Let's look up oranges. Okay, we'll get there. There's 40 milligrams of calcium in 100 grams of an orange. Now, how much does the average orange weigh? It doesn't weigh 100 grams. It probably weighs 300 grams. So you've got to multiply 40 by 100, about 3, you get 120 milligrams of calcium in one orange. In fact, oranges contain more calcium than in just about any other fruit. So I chose that one because it's the highest. But you can take everything out of here. I mean, there's nachis, there's calcium in there, mangoes. Somebody want me to look up, uh, but what did you want me to look? Banana. Banana and purple. Let's look up purple because it's right next to P. I mean next to O. Papaya. Purple. Purple raw. Calcium. 24 milligrams. Just over half. 5 milligrams in a peach. The, the problem with this issue of how much calcium do you need per day is the fact that what we've been told and what we actually need is very different. What we've been told is based on people not exercising enough, eating high protein diets, consuming lots of cow's milk. And the more cow's milk you'll see now, the more cow's milk you take in, you're taking in too much phosphorus, you need a lot more calcium. So the more dairy you have in your diet, the more calcium you're gonna need. Because the phosphorus binds the calcium in there and then robs your body of even more calcium. In fact, the research shows that every time you consume dairy products, you actually excrete calcium out in the urine, which is what the research backs up. Backs up. It tells you that's what's going to happen. And in fact, we know because we're all the people that consume the most dairy have the most osteoporosis because it's too high in phosphorus. So we, are, we were originally, the World Health Organization says you need 500 milligrams a day. The recommended daily allowance from most dietetic organizations is about 1,500 milligrams a day. And it's gone up dramatically since I've been involved in nutrition. It started off at 400, 500 grams, milligrams a day. But what's happened is osteoporosis is not being sorted out. So they keep upping it and upping it and upping it, and it's not getting sorted out. It's getting worse, and more people are getting osteoporosis. My grandmother never had osteoporosis, but everybody now knows somebody who's got osteoporosis. I know 22-year-olds with osteoporosis. That's the banana rule. There we go. 6 milligrams of calcium per 100 grams. An average banana is probably going to weigh about 150 grams. Um, not a lot of calcium, but there's still calcium. The difference with the calcium in fruit and in vegetables is invariably fully usable. Whereas the cow's milk, the calcium in cow's milk, as you're going to see now. Okay, let's go back here. You find in every single fruit and vegetables, it's highly concentrated in nuts and seeds. You'll find, for example, that there is more calcium in 100 grams of almonds than there is in 100 grams of cow's milk. There's more calcium in sunflower seeds. There's more calcium in sesame seeds are very high in calcium, for example. Your best calcium to phosphorus balance that you get is in your dark green leafy vegetables. It's got the highest calcium and the lowest phosphorus. You do need phosphorus to help you use calcium, but you need very little. And the problem that is, if it goes over a 2 to 1 ratio, if there's more than one part of phosphorus for two parts of calcium, you just can't use the calcium. So the most nutritious I've actually found out of all the dark green leafy vegetables when I've done an analysis on them is the barley, the barley leaf. And that's part of, part of the reason, one of the major reasons. One is because the chlorophyll helps me get rid of heavy metals. I can't get neurotic and put masks over my face to deal with the pollution we live in. So I take lots of chlorophyll. I take the body life for that. The other reason that I take it is for this calcium issue. I don't consume dairy on a regular basis. 
I know it's not going to help me having dairy in my diet anyway. And people always say, where do you get your calcium from? Dark green leafy vegetables are best source. How do I eat it every day? I make sure I take my three teaspoons of my barley every single day. And on days when I'm stressed, I take extra barley. Because it's very high in magnesium, helps me relax. Let's take a look. You may say, how much is there? Now, I've taken it and I've worked it out to the dry powder. And this is interesting. Because if I took milk that was in a liquid form, I could say, oh, look, there's not a lot of calcium in cow's milk. It, it's about... Cow's milk uh, is probably, it's 119 milligrams of calcium in, a glo in 100 grams of milk. But it's not, you can't compare it like that because the barley is dried powder, okay? So how many milligrams of calcium is there in barley life? There's 1,000 milligrams per 100 grams. There's 200 milligrams of phosphorus per 100 grams. You're looking at five parts of calcium to one part of phosphorus. It's a fantastic balance. You're going to use all the calcium. It's 100% usable. Take a look at the cow's milk. You've got 930 milligrams per 100 grams of calcium, but 754 milligrams of phosphorus. Now, the minute it goes over more than or less than two parts of calcium, you've got 930 and the least it should be so that you can use the calcium relatively efficiently, not even very efficiently, just relatively efficiently, would be half of that. So it would be 450, 465, wouldn't that be? 465. So anything over that, you're just not going to be able to use the calcium at all. And that's almost the same. I mean, it's very little different. 754 milligrams of phosphorus. Now, that explains why you actually lose calcium when you are consuming dairy products because your body needs to balance the phosphorus because it's an acid mineral. Calcium is an alkaline mineral. It's one of the reasons why barley is so incredibly alkaline. It's known to be the most alkaline forming food because the phosphorus ratio is so low compared to the calcium ratio. Phosphorus is an acid mineral. It comes into the body, it can upset the pH of the blood, your body won't let that happen because then you die. So it takes calcium from the bloodstream to neutralize that phosphorus. And once it's taken out of the bloodstream, it's got to be replaced in the blood. Where do we store calcium in our body? In our bones. So it pulls the calcium out of the bones to balance it because the phosphorus that came in from the cow's milk, it was too acidic to be balanced with the calcium that's in the cow's milk. It needs more calcium. We would need to have 1,500 milligrams, yeah, 1,500 milligrams at least, or a little slightly more in a per 100 grams to make sure that that balance was in a form so that we could use the calcium in the cow's milk. But we can't. There's way too much phosphorus. But then they'll tell you that it's very high in calcium. Now this is powdered milk, okay? It's not fresh milk. Fresh milk's 119 milligrams, between 110 and 120 milligrams of calcium per 100 grams, okay? This is powdered milk. We don't eat powdered milk. We, very few of us eat the powdered barley. It's the best way to get rid of a sore throat, by the way. You just stick the barley down your throat, shut your mouth. You can't talk because it's so strong taste, so strong tasting. Overwhelmed by it. Your teeth go completely green. Don't open your mouth. Nobody wants to see green teeth. And just keep your mouth shut until it dissolves and the sore throat runs very far away. You can't help it. This is getting the hell out of here. <laughs> Right, so this is the reason. Now people say to me, I'm going to have soy milk. That's a good source of calcium. Well, soy milk has 4 milligrams. So it's about 10 times in the powder, in the soy milk powder. You've got only 40 milligrams of calcium per... Look at the phosphorus levels in soy milk. It's way over the balance. It's, it's not even... It's not even, I mean, the calcium ratio is slightly better and the phosphorus ratio is slightly better in the cow milk because there's less, there's still more calcium than there is phosphorus, so the balance is completely wrong. But look at this, the phosphorus is way over the calcium, much, much higher. So you can't use the calcium in, in soy milk. So there was this theory that the, the Chinese didn't have osteoporosis because they had soy in their diet. Do you know how much soy they have in their diet? Very, very little. We're talking rural China, we're not talking commercial China like Hong Kong where soy products have become very commercial. They have tiny amounts of fermented soy products occasionally in their diet. So there was this whole thing going around, if you had soy milk it would prevent osteoporosis, it won't, it will contribute to it. It's acid forming in your bloodstream. Small amounts used occasionally is not going to do you any harm. But don't stop thinking that if you drink glassfuls of soy milk on a daily basis, you're going to prevent osteoporosis. It's the dark green leafy vegetables. You've got to be eating them every single day. 
Spinach is not ideal because it's got loaded with oxalic acid which binds the calcium. So you've got to find something that doesn't have oxalic acid and the best one to get is the sprouted leaf of a grain. Now you can go and make your own wheatgrass juice, you're going to get about half the nutritional value of what you're going to get in barley. You can stand and make that in the morning. How many of you have drunk wheatgrass juice? Man, when people tell me that barley doesn't taste nice, I say go and drink wheatgrass juice. Barley tastes like mother's milk compared to wheatgrass juice. All right, are you convinced at least from this that cow's milk is not going to give you the calcium that you're looking for? Or are you still so brainwashed you're thinking there is no way that dairy can be this bad for you? No, buy the books, don't believe me. Every time I do a talk, somewhere along the line I'm going to say, don't believe what I am saying. Don't believe it. I'll say it to the camera, don't believe what I'm saying. Go and read the stuff, check out the research. You should never believe one person, ever. Check them out. Check them out, check out what they're saying. Make sure you're getting information from recognized sources. There are a lot of doctors, and they're real doctors on the internet, got wonderful websites selling unbelievable supplements. You think, well, he's a doctor, you should know. The people that I've told you about today have no commercial websites. They sell nothing, they don't sell barley, they sell nothing. I take the barley because it's convenient for me. These guys would tell you to make your own barley juice. That's what they'd tell you to do.